So you're listening to VORW Radio International, the voice of the Report of the Week, and uh, thank you for remaining tuned in to the broadcast. So recently, I did a little bit of traveling, and, uh, you know, one thing that I always like sharing is uh, travel-related experiences, because I understand a lot of us, you know, we don't really do a lot of traveling. And if we are, especially if it is utilizing another service, uh, such as flying, or taking the train, or the bus, or anything in between, and you're paying for it, of course you're expending a good amount of your time, energy, and financial resources. So as a result, I mean, when I I do this stuff, I'll, I'll take a little while and just talk about it, so you know if it's still worth it or not. And uh, recently, I took a flight with JetBlue, and uh, I'll be talking. I'll be talking about that experience in a little bit. Uh, then I have the question of the program. First and foremost, I do want to clarify one thing, and I think this is this goes without saying, if you ask me, anyway. But it depends on who you ask. You know, it, sometimes I think that I'm explaining something clearly. In reality that may be far from it. You know, everything may seem that it is just fluid and concise in my mind, but maybe I just don't do a good enough job explaining. I I thought it was clear in the last program, but I'm just going to explain it again and uh, once again reiterate the logic and rationale behind it. So uh, that's what we have in store for you for the first portion of the program. And then we're going to be getting into the... uh, listener feedback, topic suggestions, and anything else I want to talk about. So here we go. First things first. In the last program, I went ahead and I explained there were some changes that were being made to the shortwave schedule of the broadcast. And I explained, well, this is all being done for a reason. You know, it's being done... Because listenership is low to the point where the cost of having a broadcast done can no longer be justified. And I thought that was explained relatively clearly, although there were lots of people in the comments that were upset. And, you know, they were saying, well, uh, you know, people still, still listen to you. Uh, don't give it up. Don't don't quit the short wave. But I'm not going to. You know, that's the thing. There's still at least ten hours worth of broadcasts each each Thursday that go out and are received by an audience. I continue to fund them. So the people who listen to short wave and rely on it still hear the show. And I just don't think the frequencies on the weekends that some people were talking about, really had as big of an impact. Case in point, over the last weekend, uh, with these broadcasts being gone, I decided to note down, okay, during the times that these transmissions air, will I receive any feedback from listeners who noticed the change? And we heard from not one person. There you have it. In short, the broadcasts that have a known audience stay. They're not going anywhere. And those that don't will be cut. So the ones that have an audience that you guys listen to continue onward. You know, it's just, it's reshuffling. It's it's just cleaning stuff out and going from there. That's all that there is to it. All right, so secondly, I had a recent flight with JetBlue. And, I mean, they've always been my favorite airline. And I'll say it right off the bat. It was another good flight. I was very impressed by it. Great service. Good price. Good quality. And I can't... I I have nothing to complain about. They remain my favorite airline for good reason. Because you're not paying 
an exorbitant price, yet you're getting something out of it that I think airlines that charge far more than the price don't even give you. And this was no exception to it. It was a smooth flight. It was actually ahead of schedule, believe it or not. It was supposed to be a two-hour flight, and by some miracle, they were able to able to land 30 minutes early. Isn't that something? It was smooth, though. The staff were great, like I said. the Just the quality of everything was, was very good. And uh, JetBlue just continues to impress. Now, look, that's not to say that they are the highest quality airline in the world, because it all comes down to what you're paying. Yes, you can go ahead and you can take a flight for $10,000, and then you can get, you know, (laughs) whatever. Uh, Get a foot massage and sip on some champagne while you're having your flight. I'm just, I, I don't, I'm not a fan of that. I'll take the flight, as long as the seat is comfortable, and uh, there's functional internet, then that's fine. So, I mean, JetBlue is, is, you know, what I'm looking for in a flight. They fulfill all those, all those needs. They do a good job at it, too. Because I think back, there was a flight that I had to take out to, uh, California. And I think, I think it was 2016, when I had to go out for the Tosh.0 shoot. And I forget if it was either Continental Airlines, maybe it was American Airlines, it was one of those you know, big-name companies. And the price for the flight was a lot more than a JetBlue flight. You had to pay for everything. You wanted snacks, you wanted a soft drink, you wanted internet access, you gotta pay for that, and then pay for it some more, and pay for it some more. On top of the the costly plane ticket, you're paying for everything in the flight. On JetBlue, it's free, and you're paying a lower price. You want internet, you get internet, it's free. And it works, too. It's not like it, it'll take 20 minutes to render a YouTube video. It does it on the spot. It's quality internet. So just from my experience, and I've flown a number of airlines, they're the best one. They are the one that I've had the best experiences with. Maybe they're not the world's best airline, but for the type of traveling that I do, they, they do a fine a fine job. So they continue to impress They continue to do a good job, and that's where that stands. You know, there was one funny thing that happened at at the airport. I was going... I was getting ready for security. The TSA, all of that. I know people, you know, no one likes the TSA, but they're necessary. They're necessary. They confiscate probably well over a hundred firearms a week. Who knows how many of them could have been used for one terrible misdeed or the next. Nine times out of ten, it was probably someone who forgot that they were carrying, and that's it. But, I mean, who knows? Probably does save lives in some ways. And I know people are inconvenienced by it. I understand. I've been inconvenienced by it, too. But anyway. So, of course, they have the rule which was implemented, I think it was last year. If you have an electronic device larger than a cell phone, you have to unpack it and put it through the scanning machine on its own. All right, well, I try to travel very light, but of course I still have a few things, right? So I have to, you know, would have to take out the radio, uh, the audio recording equipment, my computer, and uh, so on. You know, some of the electronic devices that I I carry with me. So anyway, I was thinking to myself, all right, you know, just be ready for it. Uh, Orlando International Airport is always crowded. I mean, it is always mobbed, always packed. There's tons of people there, so get ready. You know, you're probably going to be online for 90 minutes, 
and just be ready. That's, you know, that's all that I can say. So I prepared myself, and it wasn't something I was looking forward to. And then, before I'm about to try and get some rest, the, the day before the, uh, the, the flight, I get this email, and it says, Caution, travel advisory, enhanced screening measures are in place. Ooh, boy. Well, now, that that sounds ominous. Not just regular, but enhanced screening measures. So at this point, before then, I was preparing myself for a 90-minute wait. Now I'm thinking, all right, this is probably going to be three hours. I need to be ready for them to pull me aside, question me, you know, why do you have this uh, radio and this recording equipment? I have to be ready for that. I have to be ready for them to swab everything. I have to be prepared to turn everything on, power it on, show them that it all works. And, you know, be ready. You're, you're probably going to be at this security checkpoint for a while. So, the day of the flight arrives. I'm at the airport. And... I'm approaching the security checkpoint, and I get there, I'm looking around, and I think to myself, is this the right place? You know, is is the checkpoint even open? Or are they doing some work, or is it closed, or are they doing construction? I mean, what what's going on? There's, there was no one there. There were some employees, but there were maybe couple dozen people in line. And I was ready for, you know, three to five thousand people in line. So I go there, I ask one of the officers, I say, all right, is, is this for, uh, is this in use? Is this presently being used to screen uh, for gates, you know, whatever it was, one to 80 or something? And he says, yeah, just get in line and you're good to go. Oh, wow, well, you know, it's there's there's no line. Okay. And I'm in line. There were some cops there that had these bomb-sniffing dogs. And uh, they just sniff everyone. Have the o- okay, you're good to go. And they say, all right, I, you can keep everything on. Just put your stuff through the scanner, and you can walk through the metal detector. <laughs> So, I do that, no problem, and I'm through the security checkpoint in under 10 minutes. So, it was just funny, you know, there I was, of course, psyching myself up the the entire day, thinking, all right, you're going to really get put through the ringer here by the security, Uh, they, they have the enhanced screening measures in place. You know, I mean, the last time I went to the airport, there were tons of people at this uh, security checkpoint. Tons. And, you know, I went to the security checkpoint the last time at 4.30 a.m. This was at around you know, maybe 7, 8 a.m. So even later, I thought there would be double the amount at least. And no, there was, it, I, it was insane. And, you know, again, I was just, I was pumping myself up for something that just didn't happen. And I'm glad it didn't materialize, but you know, it was it was fine. Everything was good on my end, and uh, it was a safe flight. <laughs> the only piece of advice I have to offer, if you ever find yourself at the airport, and this is practical advice, I'm sure we all know it, but for the sake of, of you and everyone else, may as well just reiterate it. If you are there, and there are the explosive sniffing dogs that are checking people out <laughs> and just do not under any any circumstance try and go and pet the dogs or try and feed them dog treats or anything ridiculous you know do not even interact with them in any way shape or form just let them sniff you and go on to the next person 
Because if you do that, if you try and pet them, it's going to disrupt them. It's going to disrupt all the work. You're probably going to have people that are really PO'd at you. And uh, it's, it's just not going to work out well. So just let the doggies be. I mean, same thing with any sort of service animal, you know? That, that's the thing. They say never try and pet, you know, any, any types of police dogs that are on the job. Never try and pet any service dogs. You know, just, you can't, you, you just can't do that. And they, they have to have their senses honed in on the task that's at hand, helping other people out. You know, leave them, leave them to their, their business, because they're quite busy. But anyway, that's the, uh, that's the travel-related story. And with that, I would like to introduce the question for today's broadcast. I kind of want to leave this one to open interpretation. Uh, because I, I want to see diverse answers. You know, like some questions are more yes or no. And I always try and elaborate. I say, well... If it is, uh, let's say, a yes or no question, or uh, agree or disagree, I always try to throw in the why, because that will take a what would otherwise be a basic answer. It allows you to add your individual clarification to it, whereupon, okay, you can explain your rationale behind the choice. And even if everyone kind of has a similar answer, that let's say they agree with this certain viewpoint, the reasons behind agreeing can vary greatly from one person to the next. So that's why I always try to have that. But then you have the questions that are just completely open-ended, and then you'll have everything. And this is going to be one of those questions. It's a, uh, I don't want to call it, mundane is not the, the best word. It's like a general question. But it'll be an interesting one, because a lot of people, you know, liked uh, hearing the experiences with severe weather. So here's the question. Do you have any travel-related experiences you would like to share? Now, for the most part, I'm leaving this completely open-ended. So if there's a, something that comes to mind, and for the most part, this should deal in one way or another with the process of traveling. So let's say if there is a flight that you took, and something on that flight really uh, struck out to you, you know, gives you a story to tell or something about the airport, or about the planning, or something about just the trip itself. Heck, you could even mention the destination. That shouldn't be the forefront, should be, again, regards to traveling, but you could throw that in there too. Something about traveling. Did you have a good experience on a flight? A bad experience? An experience you don't really know what to make of? Uh, did you travel by boat? Did you go anywhere on a ship? Did you go on a bus? Did any of you ride the elusive megabus? Uh, did you ever take the train? Did you ever go on Amtrak? Or any of that? If you, if you live in another country, how's the traveling experience over there? So, your stories. If there's anything that comes to mind in regards to traveling, you walk, you bike, you go on a long-distance biking trip, anything. It could even be a car trip. It has to just be... In regards to traveling. So you see, it's a very open-ended question. But in doing so, I think it'll lead to some great variety of answers. You're really not, not very limited here at all, as long as it's pertaining to traveling. So if there's any experience that comes to mind, send me an email. V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com That's v o r w info at gmail.com That's Victor, Oscar, Romeo, Whiskey, India, November, Foxtrot, Oscar at gmail.com uh, Do bear in mind, any correspondence via other means will not be broadcast on this show. So email is the way to do it for the sake of consolidation and organizational purposes. So it would be great to hear from you if there is anything you would like to share. And this is VORW International, the voice of the Report of the Week. This is the second half of the broadcast, where we really get to the very interactive part of the program. 
Uh, this is where we read your responses to the show topic last week, which was on reality TV shows and whether they're really beneficial to society or not. And then we just get to your miscellaneous topics. If you do have a miscellaneous topic, anything you want to hear my thoughts about, anything you would like to talk about or hear me talk about, send me an email, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com, and uh, you never know, there's always a chance I will discuss it. I will always be open to it. A few quick shout-outs to some of the shortwave listeners tuned in. Uh, Brian in Brewster, Massachusetts, listening in on 7780 kHz. Chuck in St. Louis, Missouri. Stephen in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Mike in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Lydia in Dundas, Illinois. And Gary in Columbus, Indiana. All of them listening in on 5850 kHz. Now, before we get to the answers to our question, uh, there was one listener letter that I did want to read. It's reflecting at least on a somewhat current event. Uh, because weather stories are always interesting. I I enjoy them. I like sharing them. I think it's something worth sharing. Uh, so this comes from Sean in Dayton, Ohio, uh, who experienced the tornado there fairly recently firsthand. So he has the following, and this is his experience, he says... I might as well share my story with you. I was there that night for Memorial Day weekend with my parents, and it was one of the most frightening nights I've ever experienced. The day was beautiful, and it was a great time with my family. No one expected the storm to turn the way it did. A lot of people went to bed by the time the warnings turned for the worst. My father got an alert on his phone at about 10.30 p.m. that a tornado was imminent, to our area. We crowded in our bathroom and my, with my parents and our three dogs. The tornado landed just south of my home by about 500 yards or so. All we received was damage to our outdoor furniture, but the neighborhood down the street from me was completely leveled. It's amazing how the damage of a tornado is so extreme and indiscriminate. One house can be completely leveled, while the house next door is relatively fine. The next day, we drove around the town, and the damage was jaw-dropping. The scene of people sitting on their roofs with the rest of their home destroyed was so powerful that it brought my normally stoic and brooding father to tears. I've always been amazed by how sudden tornadoes can appear, and how no matter how much you prepare, you are almost never ready for them. On Halloween of 2013, while I was living with my parents at the same house, a small EF-0 tornado had a direct hit to our home in the middle of the night. My parents were sleeping, completely oblivious. I was standing in my second-story bedroom, next to a large window, in my shorts, watching my beloved football losers, the Cincinnati Bengals, give up a game in overtime to the Miami Dolphins. Out of nowhere... The small tornado ripped through my yard, tore out my fence, a few trees, and a bit of the roof. I was running around my house like a headless chicken in my underwear, not knowing what was happening or what to do. The windows were bowing in, and the entire house shook like mad. It sounded exactly like a freight train passing, just pure force. Wind and awe-inducing terror. Our house has now been through two tornado close calls, and it has certainly changed my opinion about how quickly life can be torn away from you by Mother Nature. I will only suggest everyone to be thankful for what they have and be kind to everyone around them. Look, you never know when your time will come. My thoughts go out to the family of the man in Salina, Ohio, who lost his life to the tornado. So that was a uh, listener letter from Sean tuned in from Dayton, Ohio, and uh, I just thought it was worth reading. I saw it, I read it, and I just thought, you know, I, I, I want to share this one on air. I think it's worth, it's worth reading. And, you know, that's, I think I said it in the last show, but it's true. Nighttime tornadoes are the worst. They're the most dangerous because you know it's out there, but you can't see it. And about the freight train noise... You know, that's that's the analogy everyone says. I've never been through a full-blown tornado. Tornado. 
Uh, Florida, of course, can get tornadoes, though they are somewhat rare. And New York just never really gets tornadoes. So I've been lucky in that regard. But there was a video I saw the other day, and it was creepy, uh, where there was this guy who was sitting in his house. I forget where this was. And there was a very powerful tornado. I would presume for it to be uh, EF3 or greater, maybe uh, EF4. It was a massive, extremely powerful tornado. And it was barreling right towards his house. Maybe a few of you have seen it. And uh, his house sustained a direct hit. Uh, I think the guy's wife died. He somehow survived. He was sitting there at the window filming this thing to the point... To the, to the point where his house is completely destroyed. It was insane. Tornadoes, though. Never mess with them. Even some of the most experienced storm chasers end up losing their lives to them. Because even if you're clear from the tornado, the debris field can still get you. They can still be relatively unpredictable. And they still have that ability to change course. Uh, that's why even when you're tracking supercells on the radar, you can gauge a pretty accurate prediction of where it's going to be. But the absolute strongest point, it varies. It varies, and unfortunately, you only know exactly where it's going to be when it's really right on top of you. Always best err on the side of caution. Thank you, Sean. And dear listeners, do understand that parts of this broadcast will be filmed, I apologize if there is a change in delivery. We'll be turning on the camera in a moment, and we will now be getting to the responses to the question, is reality TV beneficial to society? VORW International. Glowing Ice is a one-man music project that is best described as something called outcast pop. Pop music for unpopular people. Mixing distorted guitars, big electronic drums, synthesizers, and sound effects recorded from the real world, Glowing Ice's latest album, Sunshine Fun Time, is something to experience. The topics of the songs from Sunshine Fun Time range from The Afterlife, Gamer Girls, Songs on the Radio, Getting Married, and even Robbing a Bank. It's certainly out there, but with upbeat, playful EDM dance numbers like Eggplant Emoji, to the slow, thick synths and heavy industrial drums of slow motion in bed, there is something for everyone to enjoy. It's Sunshine Fun Time by Glowing Ice, available on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, and everywhere else. Music is sold and streamed online. We also have a message from Steve's Beef Jerky Company, so lend an ear. I've been developing this recipe since I attended high school. I'm currently 35 years of age, and I've come a long way. My family, friends, co-workers are always hitting me up for my jerky, and I even have trouble holding on to my personal stash. Now, I buy the reddest, leanest, and freshest meat that I can find. I slice it up in very thin slices, and I marinate it for three days in the secret recipe of marinade and seasonings. This jerky has a little sweetness and great Cajun flavor. It's slightly spicy, but if you could handle generic buffalo wings, then you can handle this jerky with no problems. Each package is vacuum sealed and is never left out in the sun. The jerky is prepared in a clean, safe environment. My jerky is moist, and I try to slice it across the grain and thin as possible in order to make sure it is extremely tender. Brand name jerky is loaded with preservatives, which are also bad for you. Sodium nitrate and such are known to cause heart problems, and you have no idea what's in the stuff you're buying sometimes, and that Frankenstein's monster of a product can be scary. Give my jerky a chance. Buy a pack or two, one for your lunchbox, and another for a loved one who I'm sure will appreciate it. It's a very lean product, all fat is trimmed off during preparation, and it's a great source of protein. I'm looking at you, bodybuilders. If you'd like more information, please see my Facebook page at facebook.com slash Steve's Jerky. That's facebook.com slash S-T-E-V-E-S. J-E-R-K-Y, 
Steve's Jerky at Facebook.com. And now we shall be getting into our responses. In regards to reality TV, is it beneficial to society or not? First, we hear from Ben in Columbus, Ohio. No, they are toxic because they misconstrue what, quote, reality, unquote, actually is. They are over-dramatized and deceptive because they cut from the end product whatever might not maximally retain our attention, even though it might be more real than what they show us. And instead, they only show us the dramatic bits, almost always negative, pieced together to form an image of reality that is skewed and bizarre. You spoke earlier about empathy. These shows harm our ability to be empathetic if we allow ourselves to believe that they might accurately portray normal human beings and interactions. Watching and thinking that these shows might accurately portray reality, I think, is unhealthy. And you know, last week we got some very strong responses, a few in favor, a few against reality TV programs. All viewpoints are welcome. Next we go over to Carly in Pennsylvania. I feel it kind of depends. You have to keep in mind a lot of reality TV is highly edited to be in favor of more drama, and really will do anything that can be more entertaining. However, that doesn't mean that it can't be useful. For instance, I like to watch two shows which are about animals called It's Me or the Dog and My Cat from Hell. Both I have learned a lot about how to better take care of my pets and think about things I wouldn't have considered until I saw it being demonstrated in the show. And it is interesting. I mean, you know, it's it goes both ways. I think sometimes it comes down to the shows as well where some programs really can, uh, you know, promote certain things that are helpful, have helpful advice, information, uh, give you that outlet to possibly re relate to someone. And then, of course, you have the reality TV shows that are so out of touch and are foolish and are idiotic. And you, sit, you, you say to yourself, how is this even on TVs? How does anyone watch this, this crap? <laughs> you know the way it goes. Uh, going over to Julie in Alpharetta, Georgia, she says, Yes, I do think reality TV shows are beneficial to society, but more so on an individual, person-to-person -person basis. A show like Keeping Up with the Kardashians may not benefit me directly, but it may have value to someone going through a similar situation. For instance, being cheated on in a relationship, having a family member come out as transgender, etc., it can show people in similar situations how other people have dealt with it and the reasoning behind why they deal with it the way they did. Other reality shows, like the weight loss shows, My 600 Pound Life, parenting shows, John and Kate plus eight, outdaughtered, provide the same insight for people experiencing a similar situation. Although not everyone will get something out of every reality TV show, they are valuable to those in situations reflected on TV, and can help those people make decisions, become inspired, or try new things. Interesting viewpoint, and again, I mean, I, I, I agree. You know, I do not have any sort of vehement objection to reality shows. Do I think some of them are idiotic and tasteless? Absolutely. But just because it doesn't apply to me, and I myself may not find it useful, or can necessarily relate to it, doesn't mean anyone else can either. Uh, you know, for instance, some of the weight loss shows may very well be inspiring to people who are trying to lose weight themselves, and they might see, editing or not, you know, what if this guy on uh, TLC, can lose this much weight, then I can do it too, you know? If it inspires thought like that for an individual to better themselves, I think that's a good thing. Over to Alan in Auburn, Alabama. 
I wanted to respond to the question about reality TV and how valuable it is. I believe it is a double-edged sword that, in one side, it can give people a higher means of life to strive for, such as moving up in social classes or to gain wealth, but this can also be detrimental. It may skew some people's view of what life truly is and what behavior is acceptable due to reality TV stars being overly dramatic in order to be entertaining. I feel like these types of shows may glorify gossip or social mind games, which can lead to people being more manipulative. You know, that is interesting. I, I think if there's one thing pretty much everyone can agree with, everyone in these reality TV shows is a lot more boisterous and dramatic than most people in the real world are. But, you know, it's, it's done that way for a reason. It's done that way because the producers, you know, they want to keep people watching as long as they possibly can. Uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, so many things in this world, though, do tack down to being a matter of perception. How you perceive this, how you perceive that, how a certain thing may impact you. So, I mean, it, there is that, that degree of individualism when it comes down to anything. Some people will see a reality TV show, and they will perceive it totally differently than someone else. Uh, over to Austin, Texas, Roy writes, Whatever entertainment people want to watch and enjoy, then let them. Live and let live. Just like any other form of entertainment, I don't think it offers any benefit to society any more than it harms it. There are always those who wish to make a big deal out of video games turning people into murderers, heavy metal turning people into Satanists, and the Kardashians turning people into superficial, stupid, and greedy beings. We spend way too much time worried about what other people are looking at. True point, Roy. You know, if people... If these shows aren't really hurting anyone, let them watch it. If someone likes watching the Kardashians, then they can watch it. Like you said, it may not necessarily offer the biggest uh, benefits to society, but it may not be overly detrimental either. It all depends on who you ask. Obi in Alpharetta, Georgia. I think second second listener we heard from over there. Personally, I do not watch reality shows. I have always found them to be somewhat vapid, and do not appreciate the constant drama and arguing to be found there, especially since a large portion of it is faked by the writers of these shows. But that is not to say I believe the shows completely lack value. I believe that the value of these programs, and others which I dislike, come from the viewers. In this day and age, people have many choices on what shows they can choose to follow, and can build their watch list according to their own tastes. If all television catered to only one demographic, many people would be left out, and the entire industry might as well cease to exist. I respect the fact that other people have different ideas on what makes for good television, as ultimately I think diversity is good for entertainment. Some good common sense feedback, Obi. You know, you might not agree with it, but... You, you get it. You know that not everyone is like you. There will be other people out there that may very well like it, and if they want to watch it, they can. So some good feedback there. Uh, going over to Dave in the UK. These shows are simply vehicles for selling advertising and promoting mass consumption. The shows invariably sell a shiny fake ideal based around looks or consumption. The target audience the unquestioning masses that don't realize the subtext are subliminally sold the idea and then equate their own happiness to looks or consumption and cue the ad break promoting products that allow you to buy, improve your looks, or increase the size, amount of stuff you own. An attack on reality TV shows more toward the... Uh, consumerism, toward the, the rampant advertising, product placement, and ideas that are really put in your head. And I mean, advertising is one of those things. Now, in many cases, I mean, look, I say this, 
I, you know, I say it uh, with this show. One of the reasons that it stays going, one of the reasons why the YouTube channel is going, is because of ads, because of advertisements. I mean, they're necessary. In any broadcast industry, ads are usually what keeps things going. But you see lots of advertisements, you know, in these reality TV shows. Product placement, uh, you know, they just coincidentally happen to go with insert company here. And I mean, it really is a vehicle for selling advertising and mass consumption. Though then you may ask, is there any mass media out there that doesn't do that? Interesting viewpoint, thank you, Dave. And going over to Juan in Uruguay, to answer your question about reality shows, I think they contribute nothing to society at all. They are based around gossip and are generally boring. So thank you all for your viewpoints and feedback. It was great hearing them. And uh, we had a good amount of uh, you know, various topics that were brought up here. That some people, you know, they like them for this reason, dislike them for that reason. So thank you all for your opinions and viewpoints. Likewise, any travel-related stories are welcome. That's the uh, question you can say topic of today's program. Share them and email me, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. That email address is the only way to do it. If you leave a comment, it won't get seen. If you leave a message on any other social media site, it will not get seen. Email is the way to do it, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com. All right, going over next to our questions. Likewise, I would may as well mention, if you do have a question or a random topic you would like for me to discuss in next week's program, send me an email to that address, v-o-r-w-i-n-f-o at gmail.com, and suggest it. It's your miscellaneous topics that, and they're so wonderful. So if there's anything you want me to talk about, could be anything, could be microphones, uh, candles, water, uh, I can talk about rams, you know, the animals or the trucks, can talk about paintings, uh, again, I can talk about UFOs, uh, conspiracy theories, all that good stuff, always happy to entertain those topics and see what you guys uh, would like to share. Radio, of course, anything really. You know the way to do it, V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. If you're tuned in right now on the shortwave, 5850 or 7780 kilohertz, reception reports are welcome. Let me know how reception is. And if you're tuned in, V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. All right, I, uh, I mentioned it earlier, and now we're going to get to it. We're going to be getting to your questions, and we will be filming this next part of the show. And this is VORW International, the voice of the Report of the Week. So the first one comes from Rob in New York. He's been a long-time listener. He says, I'm thinking about moving to Orlando, Florida, and since you are in the area, what do you think about it? Do you think I should move to Orlando? Now, that's a very generalized thing. Of course, when you are moving, it comes down to lots of different factors. Uh, are you personally happier in this location? Uh, how do you feel? How does it suit you? Job opportunities, etc. There's one thing, and I'm, I'm going to say it, and you're not going to like it, uh, about Orlando. The housing market is terrible. It is one of the most expensive in the country, and you can look this up. There are multiple articles out there uh, that Orlando, Florida is going through the, I think, worst affordable housing crisis in the entire country. So if you want to live in Orlando, uh, be prepared to throw away. And you really are, but there's nothing you can do about it because the prices aren't regulated. They can't be. And uh, just be ready to throw away everything that you're ever going to make or that you own so you can buy a livable place. Uh, and that's it. You know, the average cost for a house in the Orlando, Florida area uh, is between 300000 not even in a good neighborhood, and uh, 500000 to a million for a regular house. 
So number one, if you want a house, you better have lots of money to spare. If you want an apartment, uh, one in a bad neighborhood with very high crime, uh, rent will be around twenty five hundred uh, per month, and uh, in any nicer areas, it could be anywhere between you know three to five thousand a month. So honestly, if you're doing better off in New York, Orlando is a nice place to visit, but if if unfortunately if there just aren't those good opportunities with the housing forget it uh better you know be where you are and have something saved than pour it all into you know into something that's going to drain it away and you're not really going to be happy there uh but the affordable housing in uh Orlando is terrible part of me hopes that it's a bubble because it means it'll have to burst at some point but part of me thinks it's just the way that it is and that's not going to happen anytime soon uh, you know, the one good thing about Florida, at least, is that there is no state income tax. So, uh, you know, you're good with that anyway, but most of the money that you would either save is just going to go to rent. And the exorbitant, astronomically absurd, ridiculous cost of living. So, unfortunately, that's how it is. Uh, if, if it's feasible for you, if you can do it, if money isn't an issue, then come on down. But if it's not, uh, I would say don't even bother at this point in time. Wait for it to settle down if it ever does. But otherwise, it's a nice place to visit. So those are, I, I know it sounds harsh, but those are my honest thoughts in it. Because I, again, have, you know, experience with that. And it's not a, it's not a good situation. That's all I can say. And for those of you joining us on YouTube, uh, we're just getting to your random questions and topic suggestions. If there's something you'd like to hear me talk about, all you need to do is send me an email to vorwinfo at gmail.com, and uh, then I'll be able to talk about it. And it could be any topic, anything under the sun. I'm open to discussing, you know? There's there's nothing, nothing, I mean, it comes down, of course, to what I'm comfortable with, but just share it. There's no harm in that. All right, we have a few more questions coming in. Uh, Sabrina N. in New York. What are your thoughts on things such as astral projection, telepathy? Uh, do you think that the mind is capable of such things? You know, part of me does does believe that certain things like telepathy and uh, that, it, that it really is possible. I, I really do believe that. I think when it comes down to the mind... There are lots of things that, even about our own processes, uh, that we just fully do not understand, do not grasp. Is it necessarily how we think, you know, how we perceive it to be right now, the way maybe telepathy works? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, But I think that there are certain abilities, at least with our minds, that we just do not fully understand at this point in time, I think that being one of them. Now, one common myth when it comes down to our minds that should be clarified, just because some people still, you know, it's something that still gets confused at this point in time. Uh, Sometimes people will say that we only use, I think, like 10% of our brains, but that is just not true. We use 100% of our brains, and uh, we we always, always have, always, always will, though it sometimes doesn't seem like it, we do, and uh, that's where that stands. So the, the whole thing about the 10% of our brains is just, it, it's a myth, best way to put it. Adam is checking in. He says, hey, John, I would like for you to talk about the Titanic, the movie or the ship. What are your thoughts on it? Thanks from Adam. All right, Adam. Well, of course, the Titanic, the ship, was a uh, terrible, it was a terrible tragedy. You know, it happened long ago, but it was a great loss of life. And, you know, that's... It's, it's sad to think about that it was completely uh, the result of human error. And, you know, that's where it stands. As for the movie, uh, talk about a widely successful film. I mean, they really were able to milk that thing and just make so much from that. And uh, just get... I mean, they were able to just get the maximum, if you ask me anyway, the maximum effectiveness out of that film, Titanic. I mean, even sometimes when I'm watching television, I still see that film played in, like, the middle of the night on some channels. And it's been, what, 20 years now or more? So it's still going. Extremely successful film. 
Uh, Tyler in Mississippi checking in. Uh, would you be able to share your thoughts on uh, reptilians? Uh, the belief that Earth is secretly governed by a race of interdimensional reptilian humanoids that have supposedly replaced our world leaders and major celebrities through shape-shifting and or interbreeding and feed on human blood to survive. You know, that's an odd, that's an odd one. I've heard about the theory of the uh, reptilians. I don't believe that one at all. I'm sorry, I, I don't. Uh, where's the proof? You know, where's the proof? Surely, maybe they found a few scales here and there. Uh, maybe there's some proof of, you know, maybe they could be very cunning, but one of them would have to mess up at some point. So where's the, where's the proof that they really exist? And I suppose their motive would be feeding on the, the liquids, you know, to survive and to keep going. I get that. But if that's the case, if their goal is to just use that to survive, then why do they become world leaders and major celebrities? Why not just be some average Joe that won't arouse any suspicion? And, you know, that, that just, there's so many flaws with that. But you would, you would better believe I'd be completely dumbfounded if somehow it ended up being uh, that that was actually the case. Now, one thing I have, I myself have been called a uh, reptilian a good number of times. I get called pretty much everything in the book. So I have been accused of being a reptilian, but I can assure you that I am not. So there are no scales under the suit. That's not why I wear one every single day. So no need to fear, no need to worry. All is well. Uh, Patrick in the UK, what are your views of people who believe the Earth is flat? What compels them to believe something like that, and also a view of cults? Well, I think that's two two different topics, really. Of course, cults and flat earthers can really be lumped into the same thing, but they're all different types of cults out there. So I would I would like to save that discussion for another day. As for flat earthers themselves, I mean, I think you have really, I mean, maybe three types of flat earthers out there, right? You have the religious flat earthers who try and take like a a real literal interpretation of the Bible, and they try to interpret certain verses and phrases that uh, would thereby claim the earth is flat. You have kids, like, you know, teenagers, who are literally spewing this stuff out as a joke just to mess with people, troll people. They themselves may not necessarily be sincere in their beliefs. I'm sure there are a few that that actually believe it. And then the third type is kind of the, uh, you know, the individuals who just really believe that the earth is flat and that this information is being suppressed by the world government and that, you know, this... Um, you know, that, that, that the Earth, this, they would say, illusion, that the Earth is uh, spherical is not true, and that it's just being put on us as disinformation, you know the whole, you know the drill. And, I mean, of course that ideology has always been around. You can thank social media, I think, for the, the, the real proliferation of it. The fact that, of course, in this day and age, more people kind of know how to Photoshop, how to make images, infographs, you name it. They can go ahead and make a real catchy chart, something that's visually stimulating, that pops, and edit a picture, you know, pick and choose. Of course, some of you are familiar with the phrase cherry picking. You take a wide variety of images, and you just find the select few that conform to the viewpoint that you're trying to promote. For instance, Flat Earth. One image that they always like to use is from uh, GoPros, high in the atmosphere. And they like to find these images. Of course, of all the high-altitude images that exist, they find the select few whereupon the lens makes it seem as though the horizon is flat and not curved. So they'll cherry pick, they'll find these images, put them on a chart, and they'll say, well, see, the Earth is flat. Look, this image proves it, right? They're not going to talk about the thousands 
upon thousands of images. They had to scroll through to find the one they wanted. They're just going to find this one, and they're going to act like that represents everything, which just isn't true. So I think because of the ability to make these infographs and easy to read, easy to understand uh, means of, of information transference, true or otherwise, that's what really brought it to that people now all of a sudden, it makes it easier for people to buy up, eat, a, eat it up, digest it, and I think that's what does it. Going over to Steve, uh, he just has a short question about the shortwave. Are any of your shortwave shows archived? Uh, not anymore. I do have all of the programs in my possession, so I have the, uh, I guess you would call it the master file, uh, because of course I promote the shows, produce the shows, apologies, and then of course I send them to the stations that air them. But I have all the original copies still saved on my computer. Unfortunately, because of the music and copyright uh, restrictions placed upon them, I cannot have them online, so unfortunately they are archived for me, but I, I cannot I cannot share them. So that's where that stands. So publicly, no, none of them are. Uh, but I do, like I said, have all of the recordings still in my possession. So maybe one day, if I can find a good site that could host it without trouble, uh, we'll see what happens. Jason in North Dakota. Nice to hear from listeners in North Dakota. We don't hear from them very often. I wanted to get your opinion on how we can improve mental health treatment. I have issues with mental health and have seen firsthand that it is not taken very seriously. I feel like a very important step to improve treatment would be to take a much more personal approach. We focus so much on just treating these symptoms with medication instead of taking the time and energy to counsel people through their mental illness. I feel like we have the ability to do a better job, but not the will. Thank you, Jason. Taking a sip of water here. Uh, here's, what, here's where it comes down to with mental health. I agree with what you have to say to the extent that it is, I think, in many cases, a two-part uh, a two-part treatment. It all depends on what it is, too. Uh, you know, different conditions are going to have different treatments, right? There's, number one, even with depression. There's all different types of depression. Uh, you have seasonal effectiveness disorder. You have uh, clinical depression, very severe. You have... Uh, you know, there's all different there's all different types, all different severities, different types of anxiety, and then the more especially severe illnesses, uh, like uh, schizophrenia, right, bipolar disorder, and uh, I mean, there's just so many out there. All of these require their own treatment plans and their own means to be able to tackle them. So, looks like I knocked something on the floor there. So. I absolutely agree. I think that there needs to be this focus on, number one, being able to find the right prescription drugs to treat these illnesses. Uh, because another thing, of course, you have some of the different types of antidepressants, uh, antipsychotics. Uh, some of them work better with some people than others. You know, you hear the stories about people changing up their meds uh, because certain ones just don't work. Some side effects are bad. So you need to find that determination in a doctor that will listen to you and will really understand whether this medication is working for you or not. And then you're right, they have to follow through and take that counseling as well. Now, of course, it won't be a psychiatrist that's doing that. You're going to have to find a therapist or a counselor to talk to. But it's a two-part thing because while the medications can relieve some of the symptoms and make things better a bit. Sometimes you're still going to have it inside of you. It's not fully overcoming it. It's making it better, but you're not all the way there. I think you need to be able to talk it out, share it with someone who is professionally trained to be able to you know, help you out. Someone who's there for you, who kind of understands what you're going through and can help you along the way. 
Uh, so absolutely, I think that there needs to be more energy put forth to it. One other thing that I think needs to be done as well is cost. I think that unfortunately, it's so expensive, lots of people who deal with severe mental illness, uh, sometimes they can't afford to go to their jobs anymore, they get fired, they get laid off, they can't work, just say, taking such a harsh toll on their lives, don't have the best insurance, they can't even afford to see a doctor to begin with, let alone a therapist, a counselor, or be able to afford any of the prescription drugs that they would need to treat what they're going through. It's a complicated issue, and I could only say I hope one day it gets better soon. Yeah. One day soon it gets better is what I'm trying to say. This is VORW International. All right, and uh, we just turned the camera off. I, <laughs> I really, I felt like my voice was just going to give out on me there. I don't know why. I just, I, you know, sometimes you have to barrel through things when you're filming it. It is what it is, but I think you can tell it's a different type of delivery. But we've been there before. And uh, anyway, we have two more topics to discuss. And uh, then we're just going to uh, wrap up the show. One thing I do want to mention, since it's on my mind, I should have mentioned it in the video. Would have seen, it would have been seen by exponentially more people, but that's on me. Uh, you know, whoever's listening anyway. Keep in mind... This program continues thanks to your financial support. A donation via PayPal to V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com or via Patreon to patreon.com slash the report of the week is most appreciated. Right now, YouTube is going through another round of demonetization. Uh, not that the people in this circumstance don't deserve it, because some of them most definitely do. Uh, but, I mean, you know how it is. When there's a widespread thing going around, even if you're not responsible and you're not in the wrong and you didn't do anything, sometimes, you know, there's false positives. Uh, we've, we've, been, we've been here before. Sometimes that's the system has its glitches, has its issues. And sometimes videos will get flagged and demonetized for no reason. It happens to me. I get caught up in it all the time. Uh, even when the videos themselves, as I've even been told by YouTube staff, uh, violate no rules, no terms of service, nothing. So consider supporting this. Please help it out if you can. Again, via PayPal, V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com. Via Patreon, patreon.com slash the report of the week. Well, on the topic of YouTube, uh, Kaylee says, I'd like to know what your thoughts on cancel culture are. I don't think you have anything to be concerned about, but as a YouTuber, is it worrisome? Uh, what cancel culture is, essentially, it's a broad concept, essentially related to online drama. It's a means of almost protest, by a person's usually fan base or the public at large, that if someone did something that the people deem as not being good, then they cancel them. You know, they stop watching them, stop giving them attention, and essentially, you know, do away with them uh, by, you know, suppressing their outlet, not giving them any views. It's human nature is the best way to describe it. People have always had these ways of trying to protest, and I think it's just a means that it has changed over time and has evolved with the digital age. So I don't think these feelings or sentiments are anything new. The only thing is you have to make sure it is justified, and that is a really, really difficult thing. It might even be impossible, you know? Because you will look at the most controversial issues today. And there's always people on both sides that feel equally strong about this. And you know, you feel strong about something everyone does. Sometimes you just cannot think, how can someone agree with this? How can someone believe this or think like this? But as we all know, there are people that do. 
And as a result, with cancel culture, will there be people that maybe are innocent, didn't really do anything wrong, that still get, you know, attacked by the internet? Yeah. Are there people that did something that really deserves to be canceled? And never got what they deserved? Absolutely. And are there people where it's just a complete mix? Yes. It all comes down to perception and in the circumstance what people feel is just. Are there times where I think people overreact? Absolutely. Are there times where I think people underreact? Absolutely. And are there times where I think that they handled it just perfectly? Sometimes as well. So I think it's just a sociological phenomenon that we've always had, and as a result, I don't really, you know, I don't have anything against it. I think it's always how we've been, and uh, that's just where it stands. It's something that's existed in the social media age for a while, only recently has it gotten attention. V-O-R-W-I-N-F-O at gmail.com, address for correspondence. Finally, Claire in Ohio checks in. I wanted to ask, do you have any particular opinions regarding cycling? I've had cheap bikes before that I've ridden as a kid, but recently I decided to start saving up for a bicycle to take to work with me. This is partly as a way to get around town quicker, as I hate driving, and the more I read about it, the more excited I get to finally hit that dollar threshold and start riding. I'm not a huge bike rider, though I've, uh, I've rode a bicycle before, and I like bikes. I, uh, I like cycling. I don't have any problems with it. I think it's a good means of exercise and a fun way to get around to uh, wherever it is that you need to go, and uh, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as, you know, when you're cycling, you either ride, you know, you ride in the bike lane, or on the side of the road, or on the sidewalk, as long as you aren't one of those bicyclists that is riding right in the lane, interfering with traffic, there's nothing wrong with it. Be safe and have fun, you know? Uh, I'm... I hope I hope to try to get more into bike riding at some point. Uh, because again, I think it's a good means of travel too. It's fun. You get exercise at the same time. And with that, I'm going to wrap up today's broadcast. This is VORW International, the voice of the Report of the Week. I hope you can tune in again next Thursday, the 13th of June, 2019. And with that, that's all that I have for you. I think I'm going to get something to eat. And I hope you have a wonderful remainder of your day. Thank you, take care, this is VORW.